It has to take a ton of courage to enter a sanctioned fight. I mean, none of us are doing it, but stripping down to your underwear to throw hands with someone else with the intent to destroy one another surrounded by a massive crowd certainly isn't for the faint of heart. And keep in mind at the recording of this, we're still in the Fight Island era, but you still get the point. But even with the countless time spent training and that tinge of insanity needed to willingly choose this lifestyle in the first place, something that you have to have respect for, there are limits. But that doesn't mean it's always pretty, and sometimes that pressure even forces a competitor to suddenly give up and, no, we don't mean from submission holds, just stop in the middle of a fight. I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. Hey, what's up guys? I'm Jason from MMA on Point. Ooh, he's got video game lighting. These are 10 fighters that abruptly quit mid-fight. Number 10, Pat Smith versus Fabio Gergel. The 90s were certainly a wild and chaotic period in the sport of mixed martial arts. That was true even more so in Brazil with an incredibly passionate fan base. And this gem from the World Valley Tudo Championship Tournament 3 in Rio de Janeiro is the subject of this entry. And for that event, Patrick Smith would face Fabio Gergel, who would immediately push the kickboxer against the ropes with a clinch and try for a takedown. Meanwhile, Smith was dishing out elbows to his opponent and using the ropes to stay on the feet. There's just one quick problem with that, though. That's fucking illegal. A tough, tough call for Sergio Bottarelli. Uh, you're not supposed to hold the rope. Sergio tried to release him. So upon seeing this grave injustice, some emotional fan thought he was their hero while wearing a Fabio Giorgio shirt, ran over to attempt to personally move Smith's arms from the ropes. And so an understandably pissed but also guilty Smith immediately protested what was a blatant fan interference because... That's also fucking illegal. The confusion left the commentary team wondering what the hell was going on as words were exchanged between Smith, the ref, and people standing ringside. The expectation at that point seemed like the fight would just be restarted, but Smith literally tapped out on Jurgiel's back in frustration as he did not want to deal with the hostile crowd any longer. And to be fair, I totally can't blame him. In the old days with lack security and a mob of angry fans, I probably would have tapped too. I mean, I wouldn't get in the cage in the first place. So just like that, Jurgiel was awarded the win in this incredibly bizarre sequence of events. Number 9, Tank Abbott versus Marie Smith. Fresh off of his win against Mark Coleman at UFC 14, Marie Smith was expected to make the first defense for his heavyweight crown against Dan Severn. Instead though, a hand injury sustained actually competed at the first ever Pride event would force Severn onto the sidelines and Tank Abbott was asked to take his place on only four days notice. Even though these circumstances were far from ideal for a title shot, Tank's brutal punching power and almost psychotic willingness to engage in a firefight a vicious cockfight, was enough to promote the bout, but Smith wisely decided that he would not play into the strengths of the well-known brawler. Instead, he used distance and smart defense to slow down and wear away Abbott's cardio that was already compromised from having no camp. And after surviving a brief scare that saw Smith get dropped and defend ground and pound strikes, he managed to regain his wit to negate the offense. As the time ticked away and Abbott struggled to land anything meaningfully after that, his energy was completely depleted. It was then that Big John stood the two up from their ground stalemate, revealing just how tired Abbott really was. So Smith started going back to work with a few more leg kicks when Tank simply looked straight at Big John McCarthy, shook his head and signified that he was done. So McCarthy quickly stopped the fight. Following the bout, Abbott would go on to say that his appearance at UFC 15 felt like, quote, falling off the bar stool into the octagon. Number eight, Max Roscoff versus Austin Hubbard. 10 days before this fight, 5-0 prospect Max Roscoff got the call to step in against Austin Hubbard for his first opportunity in the octagon. His calm demeanor ahead of the opening bell certainly did not seem like someone in such a high pressure situation. To his credit, when the fight started, Roshkoff was able to showcase some of his diversity in striking, managed to score a takedown, and switch between leg lock variations in a tense scramble. Not bad for a UFC debut on short notice during a global public health crisis. However, things would spiral out of control for the newcomer in the second round after a furious start to the second. The combined effects of a greatly abbreviated camp and a sizable adrenaline dump in the efforts of Hubbard, Roshkoff began to fade fast and his aggression waned. Hubbard began landing combinations and an unhealthy dose 
dose of digging body shots that only compounded the effects. With a rapidly dwindling gas tank, increasingly obvious skill differential, and a bloody, busted face, Rushkoff went back to the corner completely dejected. It was there that he decided he'd had enough and no longer wanted to continue on further. Longtime coach Robert Drysdale did everything he could to talk to his student and answering the call for the final round. The words fell on deaf ears as Rushkoff insisted that he had nothing left, so he informed the referee and accepted the TKO loss and in turn sparked another massive debate about corner's responsibilities in stopping a fight. Number seven, Dave Rickles versus MVP. If your name isn't Douglas Lima or Paul Daly as bad as that fight was even though he lost, fighting someone like Michael Venom Page must be a complete nightmare. At Bellator 200, Dave Rickles lived that nightmare. The English striking expert put on a thorough clinic as only he could. With total control of the range, Page avoided every bit of offense Rickles had to offer. And for his troubles, occasional precise punches stopped the veteran in his tracks as he attempted to close the gap. And of course, What's an MVP fight without taunting and dance moves spliced between his self-proclaimed quote-unquote hands-down kickboxing? The antics got the better of the typically composed Rickles as he responded to the kung fu poses with a double dose of the middle finger. And to add further insult to injury, the caveman found himself on the canvas after a strong right hand landed towards the end of the opening frame. The second round would show even less mercy to Rickles, and less than a minute after the bell, an instantly opened a nasty cut over Rickles' left eye. With the crowd booing and commentators Mauro Ronaldo and John McCarthy questioning his resolve, Rickles looked to the ref and motioned to call it quits. He's giving up! He's giving up! I don't know what he's doing! He's giving up! Referee, he's giving up! It's over! We're talking full no moss style on this one. And considering MVP crushing Cyborg Santos's skull was still a fresh memory, there was speculation about whether Rickles gave up after the orbital break. While he did break his nose at some point during the contest, he later admitted to MMA Junkie that MVP quote unquote broke him and called it an embarrassing fight. MMA is brutal. Number six, Diego Brandao versus Ahmed Aliyev. Heading into Fight Nights Global 73, former UFC fighter and Tough 14 winner Diego Brandao wasn't exactly beloved in Russia. Prior to his meeting with Akhmen Aliyev, Brandao had competed for the Russian promotion in his previous two bouts and would earn finishes against those Russian opponents in each of those fights. Recalling the aftermath of both of those, Brandao told MMA Fighting that he needed a police escort and around-the-clock security to protect himself against vengeful fans. And yeah, he had a pretty good reason to think that. Here's a bunch of fans attacking a ref in Russia. So when things went south for Brando against Aliyev, his reaction makes a ton of sense. In the second round, he was on his back controlling Aliyev's posture from half guard when Aliyev suddenly headbutted Brando, prompting the ref to intervene. Just as that clear illegal move was stopped, Aliyev threw several punches before the fight was to resume. Brando retaliated with an upkick to the neck. As the ref once again tried to regain control of the fighters, the crowd began throwing objects inside the cage. With the ref still trying to talk to Brandao, likely to warn him of the upkick and restart the fight, the Brazilian decided to exit the cage. A group of what appeared to be either regulatory officials or staff of the promotion brought Diego back as everyone attempted to restore the order. He and Aliyev shook hands in an attempt to calm down the infuriated crowd. And even though Brandao wasn't the first to resort to the dirty tactics, although Aliyev would later claim that he was bitten in the fight as well, he would automatically lose for leaving the cage resulting in a TKO on his record. Number five, Ken Shamrock versus Fujita. Leading up to their fight at Pride 10, Shamrock's personal life was in complete disarray. With a pending divorce, Shamrock was unable to fully dedicate himself to training. The quote unquote world's most dangerous man was also noticeably slimmer and was 15 pounds lighter than normal. Despite his struggles before making the walk to the ring, Shamrock had his way with Fujita. With his rival Don Fry in his opponent's corner, Shamrock shut down Fujita in virtually every way. He sprawled out of the takedown attempts from the Japanese wrestler and outstruck him early. But then after throwing a few clinched knees, Shamrock found himself back against the ropes with exhaustion written all over his face. Believing he was having a heart attack, yes, a heart attack, Shamrock demanded his corner throw in the towel even though he was clearly winning. A battered Fujita held his hands high in victory as it was just assumed through a language barrier that was only fatigue that prompted Shamrock to quit. Later it was revealed though that he was not having a heart attack but instead having intense heart palpitations. Considering the amount of stress that he was
was under at the time and relative lack of fitness, it's not far-fetched at all to understand that it finally caught up with him that night in Japan. Number four, Jonathan Ivey versus Travis Fulton. You might not know him, but Travis Fulton has one of the most wild careers in MMA history. Not because of the IFC or Valet Tudo Championship gold that he has and high accolades, but rather for his sheer volume of fights. With more than 300 under his belt, not to mention over 60 professional boxing matches, Fulton has been around the block and several times over again. With appearances basically everywhere he could have possibly gone, the UFC, King of the Cage, IVC, Pancrase, World Valley Tudo Championship, and rings among many, many others, Fulton has been through multiple eras of the sport. But in the Midwestern regional scene, the journeyman is highly regarded for the work that he's put in since 1996. And at Coliseum Combat 45, the veteran would stand across from Jonathan Ivey, another journeyman familiar to the Midwest regionals. In fact, the two already faced off in 2002 where Fulton picked up a decision win. However, this time, Ivy would quickly gain the upper hand as a barrage of punches in the first round sent Fulton on his back and against the fence. Ivy swarmed and after landing some solid ground and pound shots, the blow stopped and suddenly, Ivy stood up, backed away, and then tapped out? This was a moment that turned a sure TKO win into a submission loss. Ivy would later talk about his respect and fandom for Fulton prevented him from finishing the job. Ivy went into great detail about why he felt it was necessary to take such drastic action to save someone he described as his hero. Number three, Mike Pantango versus Jeremy Rasner. The idea behind amateur MMA is basically to build up skill while getting real experience. The fighters are testing themselves in what, aside from the physical risk, which is always there, ideally can be a relatively consequence-free environment. Wins are great, of course, but unlike the professionals, losses really don't mean much outside of bragging rights. Like Isra Adesanya, for instance, he's undefeated on his official record, but his lone amateur loss is not held against him. So with that in mind, at the Prison City Fight League uprising in Michigan. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a pretty ripe MMA name, doesn't it? Anyway, Mike Pantanga was well aware of the cost versus pay trade-off being so unbalanced in an amateur bout. So very quickly into his match against Jeremy Rasner, it was very clear who was the better fighter that night. Rasner, who took the bout on just four hours notice, was completely outmatched as Pantango landed a variety of strikes and negated Rasner's grappling attempts with relative ease. After sending his opponent stumbling back and landing an impressive spinning back fist across combo, Pantango stepped back and calmly tapped the canvas to end the fight. Just like that, he quit. So why did he quit? Well, when talking to Inside MMA in the following weeks, Pantango said that he did not feel the need to put further damage on Rasner for several reasons. The two had trained together previously, they were friends, he respected his willingness to step up after losing his original opponent on just a few hours notice before fight time, and most importantly, it was an amateur fight and it would do nothing for their bank accounts while huge medical bills would haunt the rest of his life. So that deserves a quick shout out for Mike Pantango all these years later, you're clearly a good guy. Number two, Claudine Angelo versus Evlacio Silva. All right, I'm sure I butchered both of those names. I don't know no Portuguese. The timeout is a staple of most sports. With just one quick hand gesture at the right time, you and your team can take a moment to collect your thoughts, catch your breath, sip some insert official sponsor drink, whatever you want to say, and discuss strategic adjustments. Unfortunately, this does not apply in mixed martial arts. What timeout? Timeout? There's no timeouts, guy! Aside from the minute between rounds, the traditional timeout does not apply. You'd think that someone with seven professional bouts under their belt would know that. At Jungle Fights 13, Claudine Angelo would get a quick lesson in the unified rules. A Velasio Silva, Angelo quickly got back to his feet, but was then smothered against the fence. What began as an attempt to pummel under and get better positioning, it turned into Angelo calling for a quick timeout and just walking away. And fortunately for Angelo's health, Silva stopped engaging as the referee tried to figure out what the hell was going on. Angelo paced aimlessly around the cage until he decided that he had some other shit to do and tried to open the cage door. Disappointed that it was locked, because of course it was, he then determined that it was best to leave and hop the fence instead. With the crowd definitely booing him, Angelo calmly walked around the cage and found the exit. And number one, Sidney Freitas versus Mark Kerr. There's definitely a reason why Mark Kerr was called the smashing machine back in the day, when he exploded into the sport with a game plan as simple as taking you down and smashing you into a bloody mess, and before making his way to the UFC in pride, Kerr made his professional debut at the one-night World Valley Tudo Championship 3 tournament. 
Oh shit, that's the same night as Pat Smith as listed on the first entry against Fabio Gergel. So it was here that Kerr would lay the groundwork for his nickname and patented style. After bruising through Paul Varlins in the first round, Kerr met Capoeira specialist Sidney Freitas in the semifinal. That fight would go pretty much the same as before with Kerr quickly and eminently scoring a takedown and proceeding to beat Freitas mercilessly on the ground. The onslaught of strikes even knocked out two of Freitas' teeth. Jesus. Instead of waiting for the ref to spare his life, the apparent Incredible Hulk's victim decided that he had had enough. He quickly shrimped from underneath Kerr not to just exit a bad and dangerous position, but to actually exit the ring altogether. Kerr was still landing shots as Freitas made his way off of the canvas and underneath the ropes. As time went on, he refused to re-enter the ring and secured himself a DQ loss and a spot in the finals for Kerr, who would go on to win the tournament later on that evening against Pat Smith's earlier opponent, Fabio Giorgio. I'd like to give a quick shout out to Anthony Walker for writing this list. Thank you for doing so. You can follow him on Twitter at AntWalkerMMA. And then of course, the video editor of this list, Max Randall. You can follow him on Twitter at Max underscore Randall. And then finally, the person who gave us the music for the intro here, we got Ben Rosette. You can catch his music down in the links below in the specific song used in the intro. And then you can also follow him on Instagram or Twitter at Ben Rosette. Thanks for watching my list guys. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe and like. We upload at least three videos per week about MMA and it really helps us out when you do so. If I missed anything on this vid, let me know in the comments and feel free to follow me on Twitter at Jason the Heart or follow the official channel account at OnPointMMA. Thanks for watching so much and I'll catch you on the next video.